Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, I hope to, you'll be convinced that uh, this is the future. This is the technology. This is where the world is going. Uh, I think we're at the forefront. And uh, some of you might be asking you, how can we bring new technology for you know, putting, adding value to methane? I mean, uh, there's been technology. The Germans had technology. The staff hall. Uh, South Africa, they have technology. How is it that, that uh, after 80, 90 years, uh, we can come up with new technology? Hopefully at the end, uh, I think we'll, we'll try to convince you that uh, the reason why we've got something new is because we've got a different focus. Okay? What we're looking for, our first focus was how do you make something small, compact, to deal with small, uh, low flow rates of methane. And then after, in fact, after we thought about this, uh, we thought, well, maybe, in fact, maybe we can even do this at a larger scale. So who am I? Well, I've got a PhD. I worked uh, at the University of Calgary for a couple of years. I did a master's and a bachelor's of uh, petroleum, chemical and petroleum engineering. Came to Montreal, did a PhD. Then I worked for DuPont and Moore. Uh, I worked at the experimental station in Wilmington, Delaware, doing catalysis development, process development for a major Time, uh, my focus has been very much uh, industry focus. I have uh, consulting agreements with a number of companies. I've uh, worked with Alden Thompson, which is a chemical company since 1996. I've uh, had a couple of PhDs. Uh, in fact, three or four of my PhDs are working in Denmark right now. Uh, worked with Total. Uh, in fact, in a similar domain, uh, just had a PhD that's finishing up too. I uh, had a couple of patents with them, and uh, with Arkema, which is a, an offshoot of the chemical business up to now. So in all these, we've looked at palaces, we've looked at gas salt reactions, and we're very familiar with what was going on. So that's my background. And now uh, what happened was Emmy Resources came to me and said, uh, we're looking for some new technology. We're considering some new technology and trying to add value to waste wasted gas, associated gas, vented and flared gas. And so we started to work together. And then as we, we looked at the options, uh, the different catalyst companies, the Oxford, uh, Velocis, uh, uh, ZTEC, they, they seemed to have a solution. But uh, any time uh, we would talk to them, they said, oh, uneconomic, under a, few, uh, under a thousand barrels, that's under a thousand MCF, or even two thousand, five thousand. So they were right. With their technology, it would be prohibitive to actually do what we want to do. And so as we're working through it, we, we, we realized that there's three technologies, in fact, that uh, uh, let's say three pre-technologies to get to diesel. First, you have the methane. You have to clean it. And then you have to make syngas. So syngas is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. From the carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you take that and react that to Fisher Coke to diesel. Now, the three technologies that people are working on are SMR, which is steam methane reforming, autothermal reforming, ATR, and POC, which is partial oxidation. Shell and um, Sassol have been concentrating on SMR, and they've got these two huge plants. We looked at this opportunity, looked at their, let's say their, their philosophy, and then realize that, in fact, Fox, partial oxidation technology, has a lot of advantages versus these other technologies. We are interested in diesel. We're not interested in hydrogen. 
SMR makes a lot of hydrogen. In fact, because you're favoring hydrogen, you're actually going to uh, lose methane and not produce as much heat as it would have otherwise. So industries, hydrogen, industries, SMR, we've come along and said, hey, how about partial oxidation? One of the things that we were actually kind of excited about was that, well, if you're doing partial oxidation, that means you have to use air. Now, all the thermal refinery uh, uses oxygen, so you need an oxygen separation. Well, we said, well, let's, let's compress the air. And so I thought, well, you know, compressing air means you're going to have a lot bigger compressor because you're going to have something like 50, 60, 70 percent inert. But it, in fact, what happens is SMR is done at low pressures, and then you have to compress the gases to go to the second step of the Fisher Code. One of our innovations that we're, we're uh, seeking patent protection for is, in fact, why don't you pressurize it first? And in the end, our compressor is small, smaller than uh, the uh, SMR technology. So, you know, the 140,000 barrel day units in Qatar of the shell, it's got bigger compressors than what we would have with this technology. It's very exciting, really exciting. So, we've come up with some new, let's say, technology. One of the things that we've tried to drive for it is let's make it a small, compact modular. Okay? Some people would like to have. Let's say just uh, electricity. Some would like diesel. One, some may, may want to generate steam. Look at the uh, water. So we have different products, and uh, this technology will allow us to to hit targets of the, the, the economic target. Okay. So what we've got is is uh, start with methane, clean out the sulfur, compress it with air, and it goes to a single reactor. Now this is another the advantage of this technology over what's out there is that, let's say for SMR, you have to take out ethane and propane. We don't. Ethane and propane, that makes in gas when you react with oxygen and very easily. So we have less equipment. Let's say in a, in a typical SMR, you might have four or five. You have a pre reformer, then you have to have water conditioning, then you have your uh, reformer, then you have to have cooling, then your compressor, then you go to the next step. Whereas we, we compress. We put it in the POX reactor, and in a single, we've got one single vessel for both reactions. And this is this is really exciting. In fact, we've been wondering if our mechanical engineers are going to be uh, upset with us because what we're trying to do is do two reactions at a temperature differential of 700 degrees, 650 degrees. POX, very fast reaction, 1,000 degrees Celsius. Then we hit it in a food bed, uh, hit it. Uh, cooling coils, and other devices to get the temperature down to 350 degrees Celsius. We're using that energy, recovering that energy, driving uh, to produce electricity, to drive a compressor. So all our reactions are exothermic. All our methane goes towards diesel. SMR, it's an endothermic reaction, the first, uh, the first step. And they need as much as 15% of the methane to drive the reaction forward. So they're making more hydrogen, but it's costing them. It's costing them energy. Uh, our second step, of course, is, again, it's uh, exothermic. And we're using that, we're recovering that energy either to produce electricity as well as to drive our compressor. So we've got a compact unit. Uh, every single unit has, has its need. And we've got perhaps uh, half the number of steps. Finally, which, which is exciting, is that uh, we're looking at perhaps as much as 50% more diesel, 50 to 100% more diesel. In the in the SMR, you're only looking at 60% uh, productivity of the methane you're feeding, whereas in POX we're looking at 80-90%. And then because of the extra hydrogen in SMR, you can only get 70% yields, whereas again, because you have less hydrogen, POX, you're getting. 90% uh, yield, 80 to 90% yield, 80% yield going in a Fisher culture. So right through the whole chain, we're making more diesel. Right through the whole chain, we produce energy and uh, uh, put the burn methane, produce electricity, and then the next step is to put with the same geometry uh, the gauze reactor, uh, a very specialized type of 
configuration that uh, we're, we're going to tackle. We master the generation of the steam, the vapor, uh, generating electricity, and then we put in the, the gauze reactor to produce, produce syn gas. So that's the second and the natural second step. And then the third step, as soon as we've got that, and in fact, that's what we're right now doing, is deciding on what is the best composition. The third step is, of course, after the process, to do the fish process, to do the diesel. Again, in the same reactor, same configuration, and do it sequentially. So that it's very well controlled, very well understood what we're doing, where we're doing it, and how we're doing it. OK? So um, with that, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Brad Barton, who is uh, leading, let's say, the implementation in the field. He's got uh, 10 to 16 years of uh, engineering experience uh, in uh, four provinces in Canada, in North Dakota, and California. And uh, his expertise is varied in the, looking at all aspects of oil and gas production, and uh, really a key member of the team bringing our technology and then making it into packages so that uh, we can uh, let's say, uh, target what the, the customer really needs. Okay, uh, Brad, uh, are you there? Can you, would you like to take it away? I am. Thank you, Dr. Patience. Okay, first I'd like to uh, <clears throat> address the uh, flaring regulations in the state of Texas. Um, I guess this is very important because they have a lot of wells that they're having trouble bringing on stream because the, there's issues with getting pipelines in place when wells are drilled. So operators must apply for flaring permits. Those flaring permits are only good for 45 days and they can only get a maximum of 180 days. <clears throat> and this is very interesting wording. Um, in order to get that permit, they must provide an explanation of how all legal uses for casing and head gases have been investigated and exhausted. Now, that's different wording than here in Canada, but I think it is the same as in Canada. We have the, um, you have to do your flare venting decision tree, prove it's uneconomic, and such things. So my understanding is that if you want to continue producing this well you just drilled, you have to investigate all options for using the gas. In other words, if they can't tie it in, they have to use this unit once it becomes economic. That's my understanding of it as I have read the rules. I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer. Okay, so let's talk about applications for uh, stranded flaring gas, basically the market opportunity. Flare gas globally, there's 150 billion cubic meters, and that's uh, equivalent to 25% of the United States gas consumption and 400 million tons of CO2 annual emissions. Now that's the gas that is being produced while the well is clearing up, while they're waiting for a pipeline, other such things. Stranded gas is gas that somebody's drilled a gas well, and its rates or reserves are too small to warrant a pipeline to tie it in. Now there's all sorts of these all over the world. They exist in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and I'm sure they exist in Texas. I know they exist in North Dakota. Um, so the, the, the opportunities are there. Let's move to the next slide. Next slide. There. The, the, the wonderful thing about this... Uh, this micro refinery unit that I that I'm really really like is the fact that it's modular. We can add bits and pieces in to adapt it to the particular situation. In the oil patch, there isn't, and I don't think ever will be, one silver bullet for all the problems. So what we can do is we can, if you already have separators on site, we can bring in our our unit and use your existing separators. If you don't have separators, we can bring in a separator with it. So it's really a function of what you have and what you need. Um, if you have a spot to sell power, we can create power. If you have a need for heating, as in heating frac fluids, 
then we can use the heat to heat frac fluids. So it's a very, very custom configurable situation and uh, the really nice thing is you can bring it there for two months, a month, and then move it to the next site and use it again. Okay, next one please. Okay, this is uh, a sample economics of, uh, of a 500 MCF a day well and uh, <clears throat> what I, I guess this would be more in a stranded gas situation. The other instances would be where you've got a well that you want to clean up or you want to flare and if you don't tie those, conserve that gas, you can't produce in the well. I've already talked about that. So this is more of a situation where you've got a stranded well and it's only 500 MCF a day and it doesn't warrant a three or four mile pipeline. So the, the, um, the, you can walk through the economics here, but there's a few very interesting things that really pop out. One is in the bottom left is the months to pay out, 12 months. I don't know anybody that wouldn't take a 12 month payout. And then the um, <clears throat> the other very interesting thing on this slide is when you look at the conventional valuation of uh, natural gas assets versus oil assets. So if you look at the uh, bottom right, there's the value per flowing BOE of natural gas is 23,000, and the value per flowing barrel of oil is 125,000. So if you can convert your gas to oil, you've already created a huge value uptick on your assets. Okay, I'm going to hand this back to Christian to uh, do a wrap-up and summary. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, well, so what's new for... Um, for Emory Resource, for uh, Well Power Inc. What is the next step for Well Power Inc.? Well Power Inc. Uh, plan to assist um, uh, Emory Resources and development of the of the micro refining unit, and we're working together with a pilot project collaboration. And um, this, uh, this this tank will give us the access to all the Emory Resources resources. And I don't talk about only about um, engineering, plans, development, but also to their, to their partners. In other, on the other hand, we, uh, it is very important for Will Power Inc. to find industrial uh, partners interested in reducing flaring in uh, oil fields. And uh, we need industrial partners also to, to, per to provide us the composition of um, associated gases in, in order to be able to um, adapt each unit to, to this feed. So, um, in fact, we designed and we made this webinar in order to reach uh, industrial partners' interest in working with us. We also uh, negotiate with uh, Emory Resources to um, have exclusive license for other U.S. territory and this provides us um, a bigger, bigger field for business. And before um, ending this presentation, I'd like to announce uh, that um, Well Power Inc. will organize another webinar for uh, his uh, shareholders and for everybody interested to um, in, in our technology to, to, new, to reach new things about our technologies. Uh, I will do this in two weeks. To this, uh, I thank you very much for um, your patience and uh, for being here today. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.